morning. Hey, yeah, those three got some more friends from last week. That's good. Did you? I love that sound. It's not been the greatest week in terms of weather, right? We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Florida and on up there. They've lost a lot. But we're all able to praise God. Amen? Amen. The song says, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Now, some of you need to paint a smile on, and I'm going to ask you to stand and let's joyfully praise the Lord. Are you ready?
Well, good morning and welcome to worship. Yep, you all may be seated. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. We are grateful uh, that you have chosen to come and to worship with us. Uh, even though it's a little bit dark and gloomy outside, we, we are thankful and trustworthy uh, that God is indeed among us and alive within us. And so we, we give God great praise this morning. If you're a first-time guest with us or maybe you're coming back the first time in a while, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. Uh, thank you for being here with us. We want to know who you are and what led you here to Woodland. So if you'd be willing to stop by our Welcome Center after the service, we'd love to get your name and phone number and email. We won't sell it to any sweepstakes or anything. We would just like to reach out to you to let you know that we are gratefully appreciative of, of you being here with us today. Uh, as we continue in our time of worship, uh, we are going to turn to the scriptures, and I've got a special helper to help me read some scripture this morning from Psalm 146, and uh, we will, Miss Chloe will begin reading in verse 1 of Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their, their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, and keeps every promise forever. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous, and he protects those that are foreign and helps the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, Zion. Your God reigns all generations. Hallelujah. Uh, so as we continue our time of worship, I will lead us in a time of prayer. Uh, so please pray with me. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for uh, the goodness and the mercy and the grace that was renewed today uh, when the sun came up. God, we also pray for those that have been affected uh, by Hurricane Ian. Uh, we pray for those that, God, who have lost everything. God, they, they woke up and all that they had was gone. So we pray for them. We pray for peace and for comfort. We pray for those that are going uh, to be your hands and your feet, to be able to serve those that are, that are in need of your care. So we pray for strength and for safety for them. And God, we pray for all those that have been affected by this storm, that in the midst of it, that they would find and sense your presence. And God, may the same be true for us today. Uh, as we have walked in here not knowing what types of storms we have endured in life, I pray that we would, we would find you. We would find your presence through these songs, uh, through your scripture that is proclaimed. God, may we find life with you here today. So God, be with us. Uh, forgive us that for which we have done and which we have left undone. And may your presence and may your peace be with us here today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The light of the world stepped out of the darkness. And he opened our eyes. I love this song. The neighbors just playing the melody. Here I am to worship. I pray you are too. I'm sure you are. Would you stand and let's worship together? <laughs>
a great thank you uh, to our worship choir and to our musicians. Uh, I would say I think they deserve another round of applause. That was absolutely beautiful. Amazing. So, um, so uh, a shameless plug here. So this worship choir is working so hard on their Christmas special and what they are working on. Uh, if you have any musical talent that's above my own, which mine is as bottom of the barrel as you can get. So anything above that. Uh, and even for me, they don't let me sing, but they let me play the drums. So they will find something for you to do. Uh, so they, have, they are working tirelessly, most of the time, at least two hours every Wednesday uh, to make sure that they can lead us in worship. So thank you. Thank you all to our worship choir. Uh, let's remember Pastor Steve today. Uh, so his and Ginger's daughter... Um, Blakely is getting married today, um, so, you know, again, that's always a, a special day. Uh, so we want to make sure that we remember them, and uh, today is a special day for their family. So we want to make sure we're, we are praying for them. Uh, so our text of Scripture for today is going to be Psalm 19. Uh, Psalm 19, uh, if you didn't bring a copy of Scripture with you, there's one right in front of you. You are welcome to take that and use it. Uh, it's page 465, so you can just flip right to it and you'll be ready to go. But in Psalm 19, there is there's something that I have gravitated towards over the last two and a half years. Uh, when COVID first started in March of 2020, uh, we, uh, we live in a townhome, so we typically, uh, we, we didn't get outside much, you know, just townhome living, you don't really have a yard type of thing. But when, when COVID happened, we also adopted a dog, and so that, the dog and COVID, we were like, all right, we got to get out of this house, or we got to get a bigger house, uh, because we're like, we've not spent this much time inside in a long time. And so it, it made us get outside, and when I would get outside and we would walk the dog and we would just spend time outside, there was something about seeing creation around me. So seeing the sun come up, uh, seeing the trees, feeling the wind blow, uh, seeing the clouds in the sky, just seeing just God's handiwork and knowing that God had painted this beautiful picture with his creation, and it did something for me. Uh, it grounded my soul in what I knew to be true in, in a time when we didn't know what was true. In a time of uncertainty, we had no idea what was going to happen, what was going on. So that rhythm and that practice of looking at creation and noticing God's handiwork, it, it grounded my soul. It provided me hope and uh, this reminder that God is still present, that God is still there. So the same thing happens for uh, David. Uh, in Psalm 19, before he becomes King David, uh, David is, has hit a little bit of a rough patch. So David is fleeing from persecution. Uh, the, the king before him, King Saul, has understood that David is supposed to be his successor. And uh, kings don't really like to give up their power. They like being a king. And uh, at this time, historically, kings would do anything. They would lie, steep, steal, cheat, kill. They would do anything to be able to remain in their position of power. Uh, we see this as we look into the New Testament. When Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus being born, this new king of Israel that's going to be born, King Herod, he gets a bit uneasy. He gets so uneasy that he realizes that this prophecy happened and that there's a child running around, a boy two years or younger, that's going to be this king of Israel. So what does he do? Well, he uh, puts out a decree so that all children, male children under the age of two, their lives are, are taken, they're killed. And so this is, this is what happens. They, these kings, they don't want to let go of this power. And so what Saul does is he sends all of his resources and everything he has to go and to find David and to end his life. So imagine being in a setting in which there's this king who's the most powerful person in where you live, and this king has decided, hey, your life has to end. There's no hiding. There's no one you can trust. Anyone you may turn to may be working for the king and you don't know it. 
And so David, throughout mo- some of these psalms, he illustrates and he writes this sense of how he feels alone, how he feels abandoned, how he feels like he's lost all sense of hope, like there's no hope for tomorrow. There's nothing to look forward to. There's no one that he can trust. He is all alone. But he also, in these psalms, he, he rotates through sharing his current situation and the emotional responses that he has from that. But then he also, he doesn't stop there. He also proclaims what it is that he knows to be true. He proclaims that God is with him even when everyone else is against him. Uh, he proclaims in Psalm 23 that even though he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, he will fear no evil. Uh, He writes in Psalm 23 that God indeed is his shepherd, uh, that he will lead him and guide him and never leave him alone. And so David doesn't just end with his current situation. He always goes back to what is true. And that, my friends, can bring us life as well. So when we turn to Psalm 19, this is David proclaiming what is true. As both he looks up and sees around him, And as he also, he looks beside him and and reads and remembers the scriptures. uh, That both of these things ground his soul and his life, his heart, his mind, his emotions in what is true. And so that's what we will read this morning. And this will guide our our time together this morning. So in Psalm chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, we'll read all of the 14 verses. And this is what it says says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech, night after night they communicate knowledge. But there is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. But yet their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In heavens, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord, it is perfect. He renews one's life. The testimony of the Lord, it is trustworthy. He makes the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The commandments of the Lord, they are radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord, they are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, and an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them. And in keeping them, there's an abundant reward, this reward that's called life. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from any sort of willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then, and only then, I will be blameless and cleansed from my blatant rebellion. May these words of my mouth, And these meditations of my heart, may they be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So David writes these words, and he paints this beautiful picture in the first six verses. As he looks up to the heavens, to the skies, to all of the things around him, he looks up from his current situation of those that are closing in on him, his current situation surroundings he looks up and what he sees is he sees the beauty of God he sees that indeed God has put all of these things in place and it reminds him of what he knows to be true he uses this rich imagery of this rhythm of the day and the night and I don't know if you have something in your life that it's just it goes on like clockwork and It just happens, and you don't really even have to think about it. It just keeps happening. And that brings us comfort because we we know that it's going to continue to be true. We trust that there's, if it hadn't been disturbed 
thus far, it's not going to be disturbed after. So it brings us this sense of comfort and hope that there's this rhythm, this night and day rhythm that happens. And it brings us, it's quite sobering. And we realize that the same sun that we see today is the same sun that David saw thousands of years ago. And so that rhythm of the day and the night, and that it hasn't changed since when David was born and alive, and it hasn't changed now, reminds us that that God hasn't changed. That his creation hasn't spun off and gone and things aren't working. Because we realize that if our earth tilted any sort of one way or the other, it wouldn't be good for us. Just any, if it moved at all, half the world would be frozen, the other half would burn up. Has that happened yet? No. So we trust that this rhythm is something that God has played out and it has continued. We also see this this rich aspect of this nonverbal communication. Did you see it when we read in the text that they pour out speech, but yet they don't use any sort of words? That caught me. It struck me this week. I was like, I have all the words. I don't know how I would communicate without words. You know, imagine if I was standing up here today and I just like looked at you all and was like, today's going to be a sermon where I just look into your eyes. How awkward would that be? You know, like every one of you, I would just like keep looking at the eyes and you're like, now I know I don't sit up front. All right. <laughs> like that would that be strange? Like words are useful for communication in this way. Because I'm a person. But God is big enough that if God wants to speak, he, he doesn't really have to have words. And so David, David experiences this. You know, Nonverbal communication is something that we experience with folks that we love the most or that we've had relationships with for many, many years. You know, you, someone that you know, whether that's a spouse or a brother or a sister or a parent, they look at you and you know immediately what they are saying and they don't have to say a word. This is what David is experiencing here. It's something I experience often many many times in our home i will say something and chelsea will look at me and i'm like now's not a good time she's like "Mm -hmm." all right so it just happens like she just looks at me and i'm like i bet i know what you're saying so this is how intimately god knows us through his creation he speaks even if he doesn't have to use words and so and then it continues on to say that this rhythm of the day and the night and how this creation speaks truth and knowledge to us that it does so without even using words and so the question that we sit with is what does it communicate if the scriptures say that this knowledge is communicated to us what does it communicate well it communicates god's faithfulness but night after night the sun comes up the sun goes down the moon comes up the moon goes down it's faithful It's going to happen. Lamentations 3.23 says that just as the sun came up, there's this reminder that God's mercy and grace, all that is needed for that day, is going to be there. And so it speaks faithfulness to us that no matter what is going on around us, that God is going to be there today. Now, we don't know about tomorrow, because Jesus said, "Eh, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own worries, and you'll get there. But today, here is what we know to be true. This sense of creation and this rhythm and God being this creator, it also speaks knowledge to us that God is the only one who can bring order out of the chaos. Over the last two and a half years, we've become quite used to living in the chaos. Again, I've not met anyone over the last two and a half years that have said, you know what, I hit my stride. Like I'm living my best life right now. Maybe you have, and if you will just see me after the service, I would love to talk to you to figure that out. Like, we all live in this sense of chaos. But as we read in Genesis chapter 1, we see in this beautiful Hebrew picture that it is chaotic. And God shows up, and he brings order out of the chaos. He begins to put things into place. 
he begins to put the water into place and the land and he puts the sun, moon, and the stars. He puts the fish and he puts the birds and he puts the trees and the land animals and then he makes us. So this story of creation reminds us that we are made in God's image. That if you were to split us open, figuratively, not literally, if you were to split us open and to examine our soul, God would be guilty because his fingerprints are all over us. There's no denying us. And so it reminds us that this is true, that we are made in God's image. And it speaks this, that we are valued and valuable, not because we say so, but because God says so. If you don't like it, take it up with him. That's on him. So this is what it reminds us of. It reminds us that we are not only we are gifts, but we are surrounded by gifts. In this room today, we are surrounded by God's gifts. Because each of us are that gift of God. What also, this creation also speaks this knowledge to us that we, we are needed for one another. That nourishment is needed. If we were to plant a tree outside and never water it, never give it any sort of sunlight, what would happen? It would die. And so this tree is dependent upon something else for its nourishment. So the same is true for us. We're dependent upon one another for our nourishment. We're dependent upon a relationship with God to provide nourishment to us. This whole concept of following God in a relationship with Jesus is not just this solo sport. We are in this together. And so this aspect of creation, it speaks that truth and affirms it. Now, it is also tough when we start speaking of the beauty of creation and us seeing what happened with Hurricane Ian and just the devastation that it laid and we say well how is that supposed to speak anything true about god well it speaks true about the opposite it reminds us that we live in a broken world that we live in a place in which things don't go the way they're always supposed to and even things don't go the way they're supposed to even if we do everything we're supposed to and so we're reminded when we see things like Hurricane Ian and the devastation that it has that this world and you and I, we are in need of something to save us from it. So even in the face of that, we are reminded of our need for a Savior. This is why it's so important when our Baptist men's and women's group of North Carolina and all over the United States, they go... And they serve people who have been affected by natural disasters. Their presence is speaking the truth and the knowledge of God. That just as they come in to help save them in their situation, that Jesus has come to also save them from a much larger situation. A larger situation of their sin that has separated them from God. And so when people go to help others in these times, these moments of disaster, they represent the, the larger and the best Savior ever in Jesus. Because they're coming in to help save them in this small situation, but they get to share about the Savior that came to help us all. And so they, they, this is what this speaks truth to us. And so what do we do? Like, What do we do with these first six verses? That as we look up and we look around and we sit with David and seeing the beautiful aspects of creation and we're reminded of what is true and the knowledge that gets spoken to us, what do we do? What do we do with it? You know, do we just all like stand up and go sit outside? That could be the rest of our sermon today. What do we do with it? I think one thing is we, we take a few moments uh, to realize that we live, we live on this earth. We take a few moments to, to stop and just to realize that when we walk out of this building today, that we will, we will feel the wind. We may feel the rain. And those are truthful reminders that God is faithful. 
And so we, we take some time to just acknowledge God's creation. Maybe it's that we take five or ten minutes once or twice this week just to go sit outside, um, to read Psalm 19 when it talks about how the sun comes over and nothing can not feel the effects of its heat. Maybe we do that. Maybe we uh, do like what kids do. You know, kids will go lay out in the grass and they'll look up into the sky and they'll say, well, that cloud looks like a dinosaur and that cloud looks like this and that cloud looks like that. And you may say, well, that's just childish. Well, Jesus had a little something to say about kids and the kingdom of God. Jesus said, if you don't approach the kingdom of God like that child, you'll never see it. And so maybe it is that we lay flat on our backs and we look up into the sky and we count the clouds. Or we lay at night and we count the stars and we remember what it was that God told Abraham. That his promise for him would be that his family would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. Maybe that's what we do. Now I recognize some of you all are like, man, I don't know what Chris has been up to this week, but this sounds a little hokey. I get it. I understand. But this isn't anything new. <laughs> Taking time to see and witness and experience God's creation around us, if it worked for David in Psalm 19, I believe that it could work for us. Now, David didn't just stay there, though. So David didn't just say, hey, you should only just go outside and look up at the sky and just, just be there, all right? Because David also existed in a world in which there were people trying to kill him, and there was also work that needed to be done. If he didn't do work, he wouldn't eat, okay? So he also understood that you couldn't just sit and look up the whole time. So he said there has to be some balance here. And for him... What he, see, what he says here is that not only does creation share these truths of God, but God's also provided us his scriptures. His scriptures to balance out not only looking up, but looking our, by our side, looking in front of us. That there is truth that is proclaimed not just from above, but from here, from the scriptures that God has given. And so we need, we need both. I've heard that oftentimes we as people, we're stubborn or we're thick-headed, and we don't, hear, we don't get things the first time when it's said. All right? Most often studies have said that you've got to hear something seven different times, receive it in seven different ways, and be reminded of it uh, in seven different instances to be able to remember just one thing. All right? So imagine if this week I followed you around and I just preached the sermon seven times in different ways. How fun would that be? Some of you all are not laughing. Okay, you're like, please, dear God, not, don't do that. So we, it takes us being reminded of things several, several times because we're people. So God knows that to be true. And so he gives us creation that we can see every day. But he also gives us the scriptures that we can read and meditate on and learn from. And it engages both sides of our brain. It engages our logic when we read it and we see it and we can touch it. It also engages our creative, emotional side of our brain. When we look and we see all these things around us, it provides us balance of what is true. Because that's how God designed us. It's how God designed our brains. And so God wants us to have this balance. I'm not only seeing his faithfulness around us, but also seeing his faithfulness that can live in us and through us, and his faithfulness that's been lived out by the people that have come before us. So we have to have this balance. You know, if we spent only all of our time looking up, we would miss what it is that God has here in the Scriptures. Now, if we also only spent time doing this, we wouldn't see the beauty of his creation. We would be off balance. So David begins to really share what it is that he sees from Scripture. Now, again, when David's writing about Scriptures, he's not talking about what we have here. So he's talking about uh, these Scriptures that have been passed down. He's talking about uh, the, the story of creation 
the story of God's deliverance from the people of Israel out of Egypt, of how Moses had led them, these promises that God had given, this is what he's talking about. And so he says in verse 7 that the, this instruction, these scriptures, he describes them in a couple of different ways. So verse 7, he says that they are perfect. And then he goes on to say that they are also trustworthy. And in verse 8, he says that these precepts, that these that come from God, that they are right. And that these commands, they are radiant. Then he also says that what we do with these scriptures in verse 9, this, this fear, this healthy respect that they come from God, that it is pure. And these ordinances, these practices that we, that we engage in, that they are also reliable and they're righteous. And so we see this whole picture of that Scripture is trustworthy. Scripture is pure. It is right. It is radiant. And when we use it in that way, it has these effects on us. So in verse 7, it says that it renews our life and helps the inexperienced not to be wise. To be wise. No matter how much life we've lived, we are all inexperienced for today. Have you all ever lived October 2nd, 2022? Has anybody ever done that? So we're all inexperienced, okay? But we can be tempted to say, well, no, no, I have it all together. I know all that there is to know about life. I got my life together. Well, but what this scripture says is that we're all inexperienced. But this truth provides us wisdom. It provides us life. Uh, in verse 8, it says that it makes our heart glad, that it makes our eyes light up. It brings us joy, that it endures forever, and it is altogether righteous. And then in verse 10, it says that these scriptures and the, the things that they proclaim, the life that, that we can receive from them, that it's more desirable than gold. And it's sweeter than honey. It provides us guidance. It provides us direction. It helps us to know the bounds at which, if we were to get outside of them, life would get off balance. We as people, people, we need, we need some sense of boundaries. We need some guidance on where to go and where not to go. If you all were to come up here tomorrow morning at our preschool ministry and go into our two-year-old classroom at 9.30 tomorrow morning, you would find that there is very strict boundaries and there's guidelines and those kids know what they're to do and what not to do. Because if they didn't, it'd be chaotic. Kids would be running all over everywhere. They'd be jumping off the tables. They would be sitting on other kids. And so boundaries are a good thing. We need them. We as people need to understand, all right, so if you cross this line, life's going to become more difficult for you. Okay. Now, some of us will get to that line and be like, let me see how close I can get to the line before it's difficult. Okay? So we, we need to have this sense of guidance. And so God provides us with the scriptures. He provides us with these commandments that we, that we teach our children. These Ten Commandments that boil down to that we, if we love and trust God and love and serve one another, then we'll have everything covered. We need that sense of boundary. And the people at this time, they needed it as well. You know, people groups at this time, when David is uh, sharing these words in Psalm 19, they, they moved from place to place. And so they would move because they had, they had their livestock, and their livestock needed water and it needed grass, and so they would move to the places where they could find those. Now, this was before they had any sort of GPS. They didn't have Google Maps back then. So there were these paths that they would share with one another of, hey, if you want to get from point A to point B, follow this path. Now, people have always been people, and so there would be some leaders that would say, you know what, I know that's the path, but I think I know a shortcut. I'm going to make my own path and go a different way to get to point B where I'm going. But guess what? They would get lost. And again, I don't know if you've ever been lost and you thought, I am hopeless. But get lost in the desert, and you really will be hopeless. Because that, that's where they would have been. They'd have been lost in the Middle East desert. Right? That's not where you want to get lost at. 
And so there was this understanding that if you strayed from this path that led to life of water and of this land where your livestock could feed, if you wandered from this, li- this path of life, you would find death. And so there was this concept of if you wandered off the path of life, you would stop and turn back and go back to this path of life. So what I just described for you is the word that we use as repentance, of to turn back. To realize that the path you're on, the path that leads to death, but then to turn to go back to the path of life. And so whenever Jesus teaches about this in the New Testament, this is what he's talking about. And then when Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that this guidance that God gives us helps us to know where the path is at, but it also helps us to understand when we've wandered off the path. All of us, have wandered off the path from time to time. But the faithfulness that we find is that whenever we turn back to the path of life, God is eager and welcome to receive us. David wanders off the path. If you continue reading through the book of Psalms, I mean, he continues to wander. And so do you and I. But when we wander, we have the truths of Scripture, that remind us that God is always there to welcome us back. And if you don't believe that is true, just this afternoon read Luke chapter 15. And you will be reminded of how it is that God welcomes us back to this path, no matter what. No matter what we've done, what we've left undone, God welcomes us back because that is what is true. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this balance in which we sit able to see and acknowledge God's creation and his faithfulness? To read through these scriptures, to see and hear and learn of God's faithfulness. What do we do? I think we do just what David does as he concludes this psalm. In verses 12 through 14, he says, I, I sit in this place of seeing your faithfulness, of reading your faithfulness, and I also understand that there could be some blind spots that I have. And so he says here, who perceives his unintentional sins? And he says, cleanse me from my hidden faults. Then he says, make sure that these never rule over me. And then and only then will I be blameless and will I be cleansed. And then David says, may these words that I've shared, may these meditations of my heart, may they be acceptable to you. And so that's what I invite us to do this morning. To sit and to understand that we have received this gift of God's creation, the gift of the scriptures, and that between those two things, there still may be some things in the crevices of our heart, mind, and soul that we've overlooked. But the good news is that God is faithful. God is faithful when we open our hands and we say, God, I'm yours. Cleanse me, heal me, nourish me, I am yours. So as we respond this morning, I want to invite you to do a couple things. I want to invite you this week, uh, as weird as it may be, to just take five or ten minutes and sit outside. Sit outside, see what it is that you notice. And when you notice it, to remember that God is the one that created it. Now, this is hard for us. We spend so much of our time inside places that people have made. So this place that we sit here today, the hands of people made it. But when we sit outside, we automatically register that God's hands are the ones that made that. So let's practice that this week. To practice that when we sit in here, we can say, hey, the hands of people made this. And it's beautiful. Imagine how much more beautiful it is when we sit outside and we say, but God's hands made that. 
And so let's just, let's practice it this week. Just five or ten minutes, just humor me. And then when you see me next week, be like, Chris, you did terrible, it didn't work. That's okay. Or you may say, Chris, I found life in it. I found life that David found in doing that. And also we open the scriptures. I, I recognize that reading the Bible can be tough. There are passages that you read and you're like, I have no idea what this means. We all, we all experience that. I understand. But there is truth and there is life to be found from it. If you struggle with reading scripture and you say, I want to read it more, just read a psalm a day. That's what I do. And it, it is nourishing to my soul. Just pick one psalm and read it. Understanding that you don't have to have it all figured out, but just read it because it will bring life to you. It will bring nourishment. Or maybe for you today, you've tried all that, and you say, yeah, but I still keep wandering off the path. I want to invite you back. The path is still the same. It leads to a relationship with God. It leads to this sense of being close to God. Or maybe you say, I've never been on the path before, and I don't know anything about Jesus. Well, the path is just stepping out in faith and saying, God, I, I have not done as I should have done. I've sinned against you, and I, I want that forgiven. I want to step onto this path of life. Or maybe you sit and say, hey, I'm, I'm journeying, and I want to get on this path and journey alongside you all. You want to be a part of this church. However you want to respond today, I, I, I want you to know that there is space. That God wants you to step into his kingdom, to this path of life. God has a space for you, and so do we. Would you please join me as I pray? God, today we, um, we just pray pause for a few minutes and just remember and to recognize your goodness God to know that you are true to know that you have been here with us and so God I pray for us that are here this morning pray that if there would be a way that we could respond to you respond in a measure of faith I, I pray that we would Pray that you would help us to open our hands. God, to let go. To realize that we can't control everything, but God, that you are there with us. So God, I pray that you would remind us of what is true today. And God, be with us and continue to be with us. God, may this time, may you continue to work in our lives and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied.
what a great reminder that God indeed does hold us fast. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a few moments. So we, I'm going to invite up Susie Bailey. Uh, so Susie and Joel. Uh, so Susie is serving as our chairperson of our finance committee. They have been diligently working over the last several months to uh, put forth some budget amendments and to make sure our, our budget is going to come out even at the end of the year and so she's going to share a few details after the service both of what Susie and Joel have shared will be available as a handout afterwards in case you have any sense of like I'm not sure what she said it'll be in writing so there we go. Uh, as Chris mentioned my name is Susie Bailey um, and I serve alongside some great dedicated and amazing members of our finance committee it is not just me there's a committee uh, over the last few months, we have been working on budgets, both the current year and the upcoming year. Uh, for the current year, we looked at actual and projected expenditures in order to present the amendments that are needed to support the ministries uh, of our church. So as Chris mentioned, when you guys leave today, they will be passing out packets in the Welcome Center. Um, so please pick one of these up. We do ask that you take one per family. Uh, in the packet, you're going to find two different proposals. One is the proposal that's the 2022 budget amendments. The other is a proposal for some chapel renovations that Mr. Joel is going to talk to you about shortly. Uh, for the proposal for the amendments, you will find details regarding the specific accounts that need amendments, uh, as well as how in total they affect our overall budget. What we need for you to do is to take it home, read over it, pray over it, gather your questions, and then attend our church conference that is next Sunday evening at 4 p.m. Uh, at that church conference, we will go over the budget proposal amendments and details. You will have an opportunity to have your questions answered, and then there will be a secret ballot vote, which is all done according to our church's constitution and bylaws. If nothing about numbers excites you, then please still come to the church conference. It's a great opportunity to fellowship with one another, learn about the inner workings of our church, or just to have homemade ice cream. Whichever reason you want, you can come. Uh, God has abundantly blessed Woodland time and time again. Uh, and it is by his grace, again, um, that I'm able to say, with given recent changes in the staff and expectations of our church continually to give generously, that we do not anticipate to end this year with a deficit budget. Uh, a responsibility of a believer and more specifically as a member of our church, is to support the ministries that we see uh, as important. I mentioned that we are working on the upcoming budget. So at the end of this month, we will be presenting the 2023 budget. Faithful giving of tithes and offerings is required to make that budget possible. Uh, Woodland is growing in leaps and bounds, and support for growth in that way requires momentum. The type of momentum that our church has experienced many times, most specifically the sanctuary that you are sitting in currently to worship today. So we ask that you be in prayer as to how you can faithfully help us build again, not a building today, but how you can faithfully help us build the ministries that our budget supports. So please be in prayer as to how you can give to our general fund in support of those ministries. Uh, building momentum now is going to help us for a 2023 year. Uh, and so now, Mr. Joel, it's all yours. That young lady has the hardest job. Um, thank you, Susie. So what we're talking about doing to the, uh, to the chapel is uh, taking out the pews, taking up the carpet, putting down laminated vinyl wood looking floors, in including the, uh, uh, the choir. Then we will, uh, when we do that, we'll take a look at any uh, structural issues of the subflooring that we might have to deal with. Uh, don't expect there's, there's much. Um, we will install plexiglass around the inside of all of those uh, pretty stained glass windows, and then we'll be able to use this for multi-purpose things. Chris, would you like for me to talk about what we might use it for? Um, we could, oh, and then we will replace the pews with uh, stackable chairs. Um, our friends in the, uh, at CCDV have 
committed $4,000 to help with this and labor. So um, we will be able to use it for Bible study meeting location, for meeting place for mid-sized gatherings, and for, very importantly, Awana recreation area. We have the Awana uh, mat that we can use for Awana-based games that's actually down in the basement right now because there's nowhere that it'll fit. It will fit in there. Uh, it'll be an in indoor play area for preschool at Woodland on rainy days and kids worship meeting area. So that's what we're planning. Um, we, uh, we hope you all will support it because I have confirmed that the amount that you'll see on there is a lot less than building a new building. Thank you kindly. Thank you both for that. Uh, so just a moment of clarification. So the chapel that Joel was talking about is not here but it'll be the older chapel, uh, the chapel that he was married in, you and Joel, you and Lisa. That'd be good. Um, so again, all of that information is in that packet. We recognize that there is a rich history of God's faithfulness uh, that are tied to some of the aspects and elements of that chapel. So one being the pews. And so we've worked with a couple of folks to, um, if there's an opportunity that you would like to rehome one of those pews into one of your spaces that you, that you would like, or if you would like to receive a pew or any of those details, uh, if you will see Dick Broom today, he will be at our Welcome Center. Uh, he will be the fellow standing there. So you're like, who will I know as Dick Broom? He will be standing there. And then you can also come to the church conference on the 9th. And any of you all that would like to receive one of those pews, we want to make that possible for you. Uh, so we'll have some more details about that as well. So recognize that was a lot of information. You all have been excellent listeners. We're not even going to give you a test after. Like I know, I see in your head nods. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm, he's about done. I am. I'm about done. All right. So as we get ready to go out, I'm going to invite you to stand one last time. And as we go out today... Uh, may we remember that God indeed is true, and that God is faithful, that God is with us, and all that we will experience and face today and the days ahead, that God will continue to be faithful and to be with us. So may God's grace and may God's peace and may God's mercy be with you today and this week. Amen. <laughs>